Uh, we're very happy to have Tim Crothers here. He's going to talk about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you much. Uh, it's, uh, first, I actually do want to start out with a thanks. Uh, I, I consider it a real privilege to uh, be asked to come and spend the afternoon a little bit with you. Uh, and uh, as you can see on the deck, we're going to talk about cyber threat hunting uh, this afternoon. Cyber threat hunting is a topic that is uh, really easy in concept and really hard in practice. Uh, it's literally one of those things where I can help you understand the core ideas uh, on what to do uh, in a matter of 10, 15 minutes. The hard part is the application of those. And so to that end, um, I'm hoping to be very interactive this afternoon. So if you've all come to spend three hours listening to me drone on, you're going to be disappointed. That is not my intention this afternoon because I'm really hoping to give you some real practice. Um, I'm going to give you a bunch of references so you can continue this. Um, threat hunting is a really, really critical skill, and we'll talk about uh, why that is as we get going. So we'll start off just a quick, who am I? Uh, I've kind of been doing this forever, it feels like, most days. Uh, I only half joke that my career has uh, existed longer than a lot of the members of my teams. And, uh, uh, you know, just keeps me, uh, keeps me challenged. A uh, bunch of things, as you can see, I've, uh, I've been all over. One of the fun parts of cybercrime and investigating cybercrime in particular is it opens up some really interesting options for doing uh, globally investigative work. So I've, I've been privileged to kind of work all over the planet, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, I'm a sh uh, former sheriff's deputy. Uh, the real code here is I'm an adrenaline junkie, hence the uh, tech and rescue dive stuff, etc. cetera. Uh, and last but not least, uh, what really fuels me, uh, keeps my energy levels up, et cetera, is I'm a maker. Uh, I've got a pretty significant fabrication lab I've built up over many, many years. Uh, my wife will uh, uh, often say, really, we need another 3D printer? Uh, I'm well into the double digits. I stopped counting because it just gets embarrassing at some point. But they all do different cool things, right? So you, you just got to have more. So uh, my latest addition, the water jet cutter, is really fun. When that one came in, my wife said, well, what do we need a water jet cutter for? Well, it'll cut plate steel. Well, what do we need to cut plate steel for? I don't know, but we will. <laughs> and, and, and the reason I mention this is because the creativity that is fueled by taking concepts and ideas and actually building them uh, in real life is incredibly powerful for many aspects. In my case, uh, it truly, I believe, is a part of the creativity that allows me to continue to be innovative uh, in my day job, as it were. Uh, my day job, uh, I work for Target. Uh, I moved here in 2014 for Target. Uh, my family and I did. Uh, you may recall, Target, we had a little problem back in 2013. Uh, my job description is really easy. Make sure 2013 doesn't happen again. Uh, and, and like all things, of course, saying that and doing that aren't necessarily as, uh, as easy to accomplish. One of those critical components is what we're going to focus on today, and that's how do we go about cyber threat hunting. So I've got a handful of objectives, and uh, at the end, I'd love your feedback on how well we did on achieving these objectives. Specifically, I'm wanting to help you all have a really good grasp of all of the fundamentals of what cyber threat hunting is and equally what it isn't, as well as to understand the hunting process. That's the easiest of the objectives, candidly. I'm going to do a fair bit of hands-on. My deck, which by the way, my, uh, I'll have links at the end for a whole bunch of resources, including uh, my deck uh, and the materials that we'll be using today. So don't feel like that you've got to scramble to capture all of that. Uh, I'll get you pointed to that. Uh, but a lot of this is going to be hands-on. So if you've got your laptop, I'll be inviting you to try a bunch of these things. If not, again, we can collaborate as groups and uh, work through it together either way, uh, which, of course, 
leads to the practice part, because uh, that's how you really do it. And then last but not least, a bunch of resources so you can keep going on this. Making sense so far? Anything you are hoping to pull out today that I didn't hit that we should think about covering? I did warn you I'm planning on this being interactive. No? Everybody's just stuck on food right now. All right. Well, let's start with the definition. What, what do you all think cyber threat hunting is? Somebody offer me some ideas here. Has everybody heard of the concept cyber threat hunting? Yes? No? OK. Some hands. What do you think? No? That's fine, too. No prior knowledge required. That's an interesting thought. So uh, identifying the threat before it happens. Uh, usually we would focus that on cyber threat intel. I, I would put that more in the realm of cyber threat intel, tracking adversaries, although that capability would, would definitely play into cyber threat hunting. Um, certainly one could use the principles, uh, we're going to discuss this afternoon in cyber threat hunting, out on the larger internet uh, to look for adversarial activity wider. Um, but uh, you've got to be careful there that you don't bro break any laws in the process of doing that. So I would, I would certainly advise caution there. Other thoughts, ideas? Sir? Using open source intelligence methods to identify potential uh, hackers? or Potential hackers, yes. Um, take that one step further. Um, what we're really trying to achieve with cyber threat hunting is the core of that. Take this, you know, whether it's open source intelligence, whether it's intelligence that we actually know, and look for those indications that have evaded our environmental static detection. So, so again, let me use uh, my organization as an example. Any organization that has uh, a pretty solid security program is going to have what we call detection capabilities, right? Um, often intrusion detection, it's called. Uh, you might even have intrusion prevention. There's a number of platforms and services that aim to provide detection of malicious activity in an organization's environment. The problem with just relying on that is they're all static. So in the real world, if you look at the breaches for the last, say, four or five years, uh, the cybercrime breaches, they're actually being perpetrated, the successful breaches, by a really small handful of groups. So has everybody heard of commodity threat actors, the phrase commodity threat actor? If you're not, commodity threat actors are kind of the uh, another term will often be associated with them, script kiddies, right? Some of the low-level folks that have skills, have the ability to use malicious, uh, certainly can do great harm if not kept in check. But candidly, we call them commodity threat actors because the way we mostly prevent them from hurting our uh, organizations that we're defending is just good hygiene. If we're keeping our patches current, we're keeping our you know, various controls that we've got in place, like our firewall systems, et cetera, those will shut the commodity threat actors down cold. A real tip, if you see a security vendor come out after, so everybody saw Macy's just had a problem recently, right? And so Macy's is all over the news right now uh, for a security issue they had. Inevitably, about two days later, I got email from several security vendors going, hey, if Macy's had just had our product X, that breach wouldn't have happened. And what that actually discloses is an immature security vendor, a mature, uh, security vendor that's not actually dealt with real world cyber criminals. Because take, take a, a, a breach like um, uh, targets, we'll, we'll use targets example, right? 
according to the public reports, regardless of accuracy, it doesn't really matter, it's not relevant, the threat actor was in the environment for two and a half weeks before credit cards left the building, right? What do you think that threat actor was doing for those two and a half weeks, or whatever that time really actually was? And by the way, there's always a time like that on every single breach. Any guesses? Mapping the environment. Mapping the environment. Seeing if they would get caught. Seeing if they would get caught, absolutely. What else? Escalating privileges, right? Privileges are one of the control mechanisms we have in our environment to prevent people from doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Essentially, what the really skilled threat actors do is they work, they know how to work past all the controls. All of our preventative controls for the really skilled adversaries, the ones actually behind the breaches, if, for instance, you take the retail and hospitality sector, uh, almost all of the breaches, so Arby's, Wendy's, Chipotle, on and on and on, that have occurred over the last three years are one group we call Fin7. One group is responsible for the majority of the retail and hospitality. They're really talented, they really know how to work past our control. And that's why cyber threat hunting becomes such a critical component of a mature security program. Because the objective with cyber threat hunting is to find malicious activity in our environment find the bad guys that are already here that have gotten past our preventative and detective controls. So prior to Target, I worked for a firm called Mandiant, pretty well known for breach investigation work. Uh, we used to do a lot of, my team did a lot of threat hunting, and typically what we do is we deploy with an organization on site for a month, and we'd hunt with them. Right, because hunting is, again, just one of those things that practicing and doing is how you really get good at it. The scary part here is that we had a 100% track record of finding significant unknown malicious activity. Every single environment we hunted, we found a malicious actor in the environment going at things, doing stuff. Right? And so that's why this is so important. Sir? When you say hunting, do you apply fence hunting or hunting? Hold that thought, yeah. So his question was, when I say hunting, is this like pen testing or something else? Something else. We, my, uh, my goal is when you leave today, you will understand the, what that something else is. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely not pen testing, though. Great question. Sir, so is there like any categorization of bad actors, like internal versus external? Um, sure, there absolutely is. Uh, uh, could everybody hear questions, by the way? Should I repeat them? What's best for folks? I'll repeat them. All right. So his question was, is there any differenti differentiation between insiders, outsiders, internal, external actors, et cetera? Absolutely. Um, I'm focusing today, and cyber threat hunting really focusing, as I'm uh, covering it today, on external actors. But where it gets interesting is uh, someone mentioned over here earlier, privilege escalation, right? One of the very first things an external threat actor will do is try and steal credentials so they can move around. So they're likely using our insider accesses but it's still an external entity that has compromised those accesses and using them against us, okay? So threat hunting as a concept is literally just looking for these indications of malicious activity that have evaded our static detection. And, and this afternoon, what we're gonna do is how do we actually accomplish that, okay? So let's talk about the benefits for a second uh, before we get into the meat of the doing. Uh, because there's a lot of benefits that a lot of uh, aren't necessarily obvious uh, at first blush to cyber threat hunting. 
Uh, first is, of course, the objective, finding the malicious activity. That's, that's pretty obvious. But a second component is understanding of the environment. So in a real environment, in the real world, there's all sorts of nooks and crannies that occur. Uh, at an organization I worked for at one point in my career, we were following, it was a, one of the state actors, we saw them, uh, had gotten into the environment, uh, they had fished, uh, and a uh, user at one of this organization's Brazil locations had used that to pivot into another business unit and into a third and then a fourth business unit. And the fourth business unit, we suddenly lost the trail. Uh, it looked like they had staged what they were stealing, which was that particular actor was after uh, inside information, intellectual property in this case. And, and it was like, wait a minute, this makes no sense. This looks like they've staged for Xville. Uh, Xville exfiltration. By the way, if I use terms and you don't know what they are, please just raise your hand and I will be happy to explain them. Sometimes I get on a roll and I forget that not everybody knows all the terms that I necessarily uh, use, right? So exfiltration, that's actually getting the stolen data out of our environment so that they can, it's the act of the theft, right? So we, we looked at the box, it was a server, so this was around 2010. Uh, obviously I'm not sharing the who's because these are real. Uh, I'll, I'll use lots of stories today, but we can't uh, share to protect the victims uh, of these. Uh, in this case, what had happened was it was an old SQL server uh, sitting in this particular business unit, Microsoft SQL Server. Um, and it looked like it was a dead end, right? The, the box itself had no internet connectivity. It only had connectivity to the internal organization. Yet it looked like when we did the uh, investigation uh, on the host remotely, so this, bo this box was sitting in France. We're investigating it from the US um, like it had been used for the exfiltration. So we went back and took a deeper look at the box ran a, a much more uh, forensics analysis. Long story short, what we found was that this particular box had a second nick in it. At some point, the local IT person in that office needed to apply patches to the SQL server. And because the SQL server didn't have access to the internet, they couldn't download the patches for the SQL server. So they threw a second nick in the box and plugged it into the local cable modem access there in the office, thus bridging directly out to the internet, okay? Unknowingly creating a bridge and a complete unmonitored uh, access to the internet. Well, so why this is relevant to increased understanding of the environment, this story I mean, is because this is an organization that had over a million hosts. So think about a threat actor who has found a box in a office out of a million hosts that is bridged and has access to the internet outside of the organization's controls. That's often the level of sophistication and capability that we're dealing with. And if we don't also have similar levels of understanding of our environment, where the dark nooks and crannies and corners of our organization's environment is, we are going to be unlikely to be successful in defending that organization. And so threat hunting is a really great way to find the environment and to understand the environment at levels that you will never understand if you're just using um, you know, tooling like uh, and map scans and stuff like that, right? Those are great, nothing wrong with those, but you gain a completely different level of understanding and, and hopefully as we, we start practicing some of this, you'll, you'll understand that. Uh, of course, the third component is you develop skills for finding anomalies in our environment. This is again, a really critical skill, not just for security, but also for all sorts of operational purposes as well.
right? That same depth of understanding, being able to understand and evaluate anomalies is a critical skill uh, for us. Uh, and last but not least, it really should be become a mechanism for improving our static detection. So if I do a hunt in my organization and I discover un malicious activity, part of what I'm going to want to do then is do an analysis to figure out how did that actor get in, how did they evade our detection, so that we can go back and improve our detection. It becomes a really critical uh, capability for constantly making our detection better. Ideally, anything we find in hunting should never need to be found in hunting again. Um, making sense so far? Okay. If I'm going too fast, et cetera, holler out. All right, but I don't want to paint this, this rosy picture where threat hunting is all positives. Uh, let me be clear, it is a lot of work. And I mean a lot of work, especially starting out. What they're, they're, you know, it's the classic kind of learning curve. What happens is, you know, starting out, if we've got a couple axes and we'll go, all right, this is our effort on our x-axis here, right? And this is the value of what we find as measured by things like how fast we find things, how interesting we find things. This curve kind of goes like this before it really takes off on us. So don't get discouraged in your early efforts. One of the things I brought along, I'm also going to give you um, uh, URLs for, uh, are tons and tons of packets. I have almost two terabytes of network packets uh, on here uh, that I downloaded. Originally, I was, I was going to focus on machine learning. Unfortunately, I couldn't find clean pa uh, network packet data that didn't have malicious activity on it. So I pivoted and we're going to hunt in that malicious or in that packet activity because I found all sorts of malicious activity in it. So it is a lot of work. Uh, and of course, like I said, slow going. It's also important to understand that this is a manual effort by design. What you're going to find is a lot of vendors out there who go, oh, we automate hunting for you. No, that's just detection. Uh, that is not hunting. Um, like many things, I'm trying to be very precise in giving you the concepts of what cyber threat hunting is because unfortunately we work in an industry uh, in security where uh, there's inevitably some vendors that marketing programs misuse the terms and over time they get really confusing on what they are. Uh, the definition we're using this afternoon is not the only not even, I would say, the only right definition, uh, but it's the one we're focusing on this afternoon, right? Okay, so pros and cons, uh, this is the process. Really simple, right? So we want to start out with a hypothesis. The hypothesis, I'll, come, I'll give you some examples to that in just a second. Then we need to go to the relevant data. This is often the most time-consuming step, part number two. So let's say, for instance, uh, our hypothesis is, well, malware that's masquerading as legitimate uh, software in my organization is going to use uh, HTTP, because that's what most of the comms are in our environments today, but a lot of the malware hand rolls their HTTP because of various things they need to do to communicate with command and control. Okay, so let me give you a, a quick brief primer on, on how malware works in, in a modern uh, cyber crime day. Here a second, just to make sure everybody's aligned appropriately. So you've got, all right, we've got our laptop. We'll say this is my laptop. It's Monday morning. Blood level in my caffeine system is too high. 
I, I get this malicious fish, and it's got a link in it, and I click on it, okay? And what that does is that installs some malware on my laptop. That's actually a multi-stage process. We'll, we'll talk about that in more depth in just a, a little bit. But because every organization has firewalls, right? It, there, there's from outside on the internet, you can't just connect in at most organizations. There's very, very few organizations that a threat actor can just directly connect in to my laptop, for instance, right? And they know this, so they trick me into installing my stuff, and then, of course, that gets out to them. And then it's going to communicate with what we call a C2 server, command and control, okay? And then somewhere out here, we've got the actual cyber criminal. And what they do is they issue their commands to the C2 server. Those get pulled from the C2 server by the malicious software running in my laptop. So we're reaching out from the host inside. Okay. Well, so back to my example on hypothesis, this malware is going to be communicating via the same, they want it to hide in the noise, right? They don't want us to be detected. And so since they're going to be trying to hide in the noise, they're going to use the same protocol. But this C2 server is most often not just a standard server. It does special things. They want to be able to issue commands and so on and so forth. And so they yip typically the HTTP sessions that are being created are what we often call hand-rolled. So in other words, they're actually building it instead of using the standard library. So most legitimate software today, right, software that's running in my Mac, if it's, I'm a legitimate Mac software developer, what do I use? I use the OSX libraries for the HTTP communications, right? If I'm on Windows, I use the Microsoft libraries, Linux, use one of the Linux libraries. Well, if you look at the RFCs, right, request for comments, the, the actual documentation and specification for all the different protocols on the internet, the RFCs for HTTP don't say this is the standard order that you should do your headers in. Everybody tracking with me so far? But, big surprise, the actual libraries do have conventions. So if you use the Mac, Linux, or Windows libraries to write software to communicate on the internet, your headers are actually going to end up with particular characteristics just by dint of using those libraries. Very rarely are the adversaries sophisticated enough to understand those nuances. And so there's an example where we can differentiate. For instance, if we do a, a, a HTTP session, what, at, what header in HTTP is used to identify the kind of device uh, and operating system and stuff like that? Where, where is that in the HTTP headers? No, nope. good thought. User agent. There's a user agent header in HTTP that contains this string the string indicates what kind of hardware, what operating system version, what browser version, whole bunch of data like that in it. But it's just a string. Any software can put whatever string they want, right? If you go out to useragents.com, really valuable resource, they'll show you the table of the thousands and thousands of different user agents and what they map to. So if I'm a malicious actor, I embed a user agent in to my hand-rolled packets, right, my HTTP headers, well, what inevitably happens? Remember, these are people, right? The, the, we often get fixated in cybersecurity on the tools, okay? So in this case, on the malware. It's really important for us to remember that these are just their tools, right? The, this malware, the threat actor, has a, an objective. They have a goal that they're hoping to accomplish using 
this malware. Maybe they just want to encrypt my hard drive. I mean, there's all sorts of things they could be potentially doing. But it's just a tool. It's people writing these tools just like anything else. So on, in the real world, your browser gets updated, what, weekly? You know, Chrome, Firefox, uh, most of the browsers, uh, Safari, right, get updated on a constant basis. Um, really, really rapid pace of change. Every time your browser updates, the user agent string updates to reflect accordingly. And what inevitably happens with a bunch of the malicious actors is they put that in their code and then they forget about it. So it's now six months later and that user agent is not relevant anymore. There's a mismatch, right? So that might be an example of a hypothesis then we could use to hunt for unknown malicious activity, right? Our hypothesis then becomes something like, well, the uh, malware that's running in the environment is going to have user agents that have discrepancies with the actual case, right? So I might see a Mac user agent coming from a Windows host, or I might see vice versa, and so on and so forth, right? Things that make no sense in the real world when we actually stop and look at it. So that's our hypothesis, is that's a way to find some unknown malicious activity. Then we've got to gather the relevant data. Well, what's the relevant data in this case? We're going to need HTTP headers from the environment. We're going to need some way to collect a whole bunch of network traffic and then extract out the HTTP headers so we can look for the indications of our hypothesis in that HTTP traffic. Is that still making sense? Everybody still tracking with me? And, and of course, then the analysis is just the cycling of that. All right, now I've got all of my data. I'm looking for these mismatches. We'll talk more about some of the analysis here uh, as we progress this afternoon. But that's, that's the process. As a process, it's, it's easy. What makes it hard, of course, to do is knowing things like I just gave you an example of, right? Luckily, there's a whole bunch of resources to help with that, and I'll point you to a bunch of those. And with practice, you actually get really good at spotting ones that you've never seen before. Okay? All right, everybody still tracking? All right, let's keep rolling then. So let's start then with adversarial understanding. So I'm going to break out of slideshow here. So this is a screenshot. If you've got your laptops, uh, let's see if I can move this over. There we go. So this is, uh, you know what, I think I'm just going to mirror these at this point. All right, so go to this URL, attack.miter.org. Write it out, just in case you can't see. Just the word attack.miter.org. Is everybody familiar with MITRE? Hopefully. If you're not, you should be. Uh, Extra bonus uh, lesson for today, go spend some time at MITRE. MITRE is one of the key groups doing cybersecurity research. Uh, they provide, if you want to understand cutting edge, you should be following a lot of MITRE's work. And the cool part is everything MITRE does is open source. Uh, they do all kinds of partnerships. If you want to volunteer to help on some of the committees, there's all sorts of options. But what, what I've got here is what's called the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So what they're trying to do with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and this is a coalition of not just MITRE, but thousands of people trying to help, is how do we codify all of this ATT&CK stuff that the threat actors use? And across the top here, we've got basically different phases of ATT&CKs that the threat actors perpetrate. So we've got initial access, execution, persistence. And then underneath each of these phases 
are a whole bunch of examples of how they accomplish things they do in detail. So for instance, persistence, this, the example here, persistence is the term we use for the malware staying on the laptop even when the laptop might get rebooted, et cetera, right? Uh, that's persistence. So if we go to persistence, you'll see there's a whole bunch of ways that they accomplish persistence. Let's go, let's do one that'd be interesting. That I'm guessing a lot of folks might not be familiar with called port knocking. So port knocking is this technique whereby uh, a software only responds if you send it a specific sequence of packets. So the idea with port knocking is kind of like the, the, the real world secret knock, right? I'm gonna come up, the software only opens up if I write a particular sequence of packets. That's essentially what port knocking is, okay? And what happens here is we've got examples of software that actually uses it. We've got uh, background data on it. It's all codified, et cetera. And part of the advantage of attack, by the way, is a lot of the, the detection and et cetera uh, is using it. Why this is so powerful for us, though, when we are looking at uh, learning how to cy hunt, do cyber threat hunting is because it's a phenomenal resource, the single best resource in the world on understanding the tools and things that the real world adversaries are using today against our organizations, right? And so when we go through here, we'll see all sorts of reference papers, um, techniques for mitigating it, et cetera, but we can dig into this. So here, for instance, is a reference to a paper. Click the link, give it a second. And you can see all of the particulars about how it works, right? And of course, why this is really useful for us, there's the um, IDA Pro disassembly of the of the uh, malware, there's the actual port knocking sequence being explained in the di diagram, et cetera. So you get the kind of granularity of technical details that you would then turn into a hypothesis, right? So in this case, maybe we want to go, all right, I wanna look for evidence of port knocking being used in my environment to see if that is going on. And so going through here, notice we've got a very specific packet structure that explains what that packet looks like. That makes it pretty darn easy to go looking for it then. We're still gonna need to go collect packet data. Uh, by the way, I probably should have mentioned um, when hunting, most of the time, you're going to be hunting either on the host layer or the network layer. Uh, typically, you're going to choose one of those. One isn't better or worse, they're just different. Uh, obviously, the data sources. Today, I'm going to be using examples from network primarily, only because I could find network data that I could share with you freely uh, that has malicious activity on, on, in it for you to practice with, uh, and I couldn't find any open source uh, host data. Uh, to go looking at uh, for pretty obvious reasons, uh, but one of these days hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll have some resources to that, okay? So there's port knocking. As you can see, there are tons and tons of methodologies here. Uh, we've got initial access, execution, persistence, privilege escalation, uh, Defense evasion, uh, that's particularly interesting. Credential access, so on and so forth. So one of the things I would highly recommend uh, for you uh, as, as to help you on your career is spend some time getting very familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, 
It's free uh, and just incredible uh, source of data. All right, so this is then one of our primary tools for uh, starting to understand the adversaries. And at this point, we're in good shape so far. Uh, what I'd love you all to do is break up a little bit, work together, and identify in the attack framework some interesting things uh, for you to potentially hunt on uh, when we move to our network stuff later. I warned you, interactive. Did everybody find something interesting? Anybody willing to share? Well, let me step back a second. Did everybody find something new that they weren't familiar with before? Hopefully. I see a few heads nodding. OK. Here's the, the interesting thing about this. You know, uh, obviously, I've been doing this a long time. I still know this much of this much. I would, I would suggest that's what makes this interesting. Uh, or one of the many things, I should say, that makes this field so interesting, is that we can't stay on top of all of the things all the time. It's just not possible. That's why cybersecurity, frankly, is a team sport, not a solo sport, uh, because we, we can only be successful partnering together with each other candidly. Um, but so who's, who's game to share? Uh, something interesting they found uh, and think might be uh, an interesting hunt. Sir? Um, I found the drive-by compromise interesting. Okay. Wasn't sure what that was, looked at it. And then basically it's they get you to go to a website that, by posting something. And yeah. I've had this happen like Stack Overflow, yeah. searching for a problem, how to fix something. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this, this website had an excellent link for it. Or, you know, here's a link to it. And you click and it's like, some right you know right yeah the the so if everybody didn't catch that he was describing drive by uh uh compromise right uh i actually just had that happen uh recently um a friend of mine sent me an article to the local newspaper here in the twin cities uh and an ad there and there was a malicious ad embedded in you know, it wasn't that the newspaper's website had been compromised, but when I went to read the ad, part, or read the, sorry, the article, there was a malicious ad that had been slipped in to the source, you know, they, that's all federated, right? They're, they're pulling it from another source. Again, not criticizing our local newspaper at all uh, by this, uh, but literally tried to compromise uh, my box, and which of course sent me an hour of, of reverse engineering because I wanted to know who it was and what they were trying to do. But that's a story for another day. Drive by. Any Another interesting one somebody wants to share? Be bold. Don't be bashful. Sir, I thought uh, the bash RC, uh, this malicious modification of the bash RC file was kind of interesting. Yeah. Because I use you know my bash RC file quite a bit. Yeah. And it's just kind of spooky to me to think like, oh, what if someone you know modified one of my favorite uh, scripts or one of my favorite aliases yeah. and you know, had to do something entirely different? Right. Right. So he's describing the bash RC, right? And and there's a great example of a persistence mechanism, right? Whereby uh, let's say you get tricked into clicking something and they get it slipped into your computer. Because you're running with your privileges, you have access to your bash RC. So it's a great technique for the adversaries to drive persistence. And how many of us that are driving Linux go regularly look at our bash RC to make sure that it's got nothing extra in it? Or that we haven't installed via pip or some of the other you know, uh, tools that we use to install the tools on our system that have an updated bash RC with some paths and stuff like that and, and that we're going to notice. It's a simple but really insidious technique. Anybody else game to share? OK. Uh, give me some more. Give a, give a, give, share with the class. Why, why did you find that interesting and 
What's the technique? Yeah, so I'm reading about it. Like it basically identifies what is the strength of the passwords, uh, like in the Indian organization. And then, okay. Uh, how many times we can try before locking an account? Sure. So then, like they, they can't lock all the accounts by trying by two four. Yep. Yep. And and knowing then the password policy discovery technique. It's pretty straightforward to go hunt for that, right? We can look for failed login attempts because as they're trying to figure out exactly what the limits of our password policy are, they're going to need to make login attempts. A uh, lot more attempts than are probably going to be normal, uh, which should stand out, right? When we talk about analysis in a little bit, a lot of the techniques that we will use for analysis are simple sorting things, right? Most of the interesting hunting things are either really unique or really prevalent. What you'll find in hunting is most of the time the really interesting stuff is at one extreme or the other, right? So when you do a distribution curve of user agents, for instance, using my earlier example, unique user agents or very rare user agents. You know, in, in an organization, for instance, target size, having user agents that are used on, say, 20 or less devices, right? We've got hundreds of thousands of devices in the environment. So if it's 20 or less, then it might be worth looking at. The interesting bit, though, is ultimately, that's where your experience becomes really, really valuable as you practice and practice at this, because you get better at figuring out what are those thresholds that I should focus on. Because in an environment target size, as again, continuing example, 50 might be the right threshold rather than 20. Because if the adversary has maybe, say, compromised 25 hosts, then there's potentially 25 of those user agents, not just 20. But if I'm in an organization that only has a couple hundred hosts, then I'm probably going to look for things that are just running on two or three hosts, uh, for instance, um, as an example. So one of the other things I wanted to point out while we were on the, the TAC framework site here is there's also just a ton of, so I went to uh, data encoding under command and control. Um, and this is just a whole bunch of information on different encoding techniques used by adversaries. Well, one of the things I wanted to point out here is notice the long, long list of adversaries uh, that they're giving examples for. And if it's up on attack, uh, by the way, there's been a lot of validation before it goes here, right? So I'll pick one in particular, APT19, uh, commonly referred to as Kadoso or Kadoso team. This is one of the uh, Chinese uh, state groups. Yes, we live in a world where the state uh, agencies often come for our private companies. Um, and this isn't just China, this is all sorts of, uh, I'm not picking on China, uh, I actually lived there for a while, did an expat there at one point in my career, uh, and quite loved that country. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Um, but certainly the Chinese uh, government has been one of the groups very active at uh, using uh, some of these techniques. Well, why this is, is relevant is because, again, there's tons and tons of details here. But... What I would suggest gets really interesting is notice when we get down here to software used by the group, Cobalt Strike and Empire, that refers to PowerShell Empire, are commercial software packages designed by companies or by security vendors to be used by companies mostly for pen testing purposes. Okay? Um, these are also used by uh, cybercrime groups, uh, not just uh, state, not just pure cybercrime, um, 
and then they're also used by, of course, legitimate organizations. That is not an accident. That is all designed to make attribution really difficult. Attribution as in who is the threat actor here. And the key that I want to point out in this is when you're learning the adversaries and their techniques, don't worry about the attribution point. That's a rabbit hole that you can go down that unless you're looking, you know, you're in law enforcement agency looking to make arrests or something like that, it's probably not relevant. What's really relevant for us as defenders is how do these techniques work? How do we defend against these? How do we know about these and, and look for them in the environment? Uh, it's just an area that I wanted to mention in passing because it's, it's, a, it's a trap, uh, right? Uh, I'm sure you all remember the, uh, the uh, Star Wars reference, right? The, uh, <laughs> uh, now you're all thinking of me as Akbar. But uh, the, uh, uh, it really can be. Uh, and that's uh, a caution that I want to throw out that is really easy to get sucked into as you're learning on the adversaries. The who it is really isn't relevant for the vast majority of the work we do. Uh, there's very, very rare cases where it becomes relevant, um, but the techniques and tools used are. You understanding Cobalt Strike and PowerShell Empire in particular, these are two of the tools that are used by a huge number of threat actor groups. And so the power of you focusing and understanding how that tool works, what does it look like in the environment? How do you find it? Is incredibly important for you being able to defend. And the beauty of that is then, by just focusing on that one set of, of tooling, you, you gain the ability to defend against a whole broad swath of threat actors. Does that make sense? All right, so that is, uh, that is the attack, MITRE attack framework. Let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming here. Uh, other than, let's try this again. There we go. All right. Now, as we advance to the next part, I need to give a very, very, very important warning. Now we're going to shift into specific tooling, specifically the site we're going to work towards next, has live malware on it. Okay. Um, you want to be super careful here. I would highly recommend that all of the stuff in the next part that you do on a virtual machine that you can just, you know, reset. So I've done reverse engineering for something like 15 years now, okay? And I still occasionally screw up and self-infect when handling the malware. It's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen, okay? And infecting your host machine and having to rebuild your host machine is a real pain in the posterior. Uh, maybe you enjoy that process. I do not. So super important caveat, but here's the thing. If you don't learn to deal with and handle this stuff, you're going to be missing an important area of being able to defend your organizations, okay? So you got to be really careful, but uh, it is super important. So the best source, hands down, is malwaretrafficanalysis.net. That's where we're going to head next. Uh, it's maintained completely uh, for free by Brad Duncan uh, at Malware Traffic is his uh, Twitter handle. Uh, Brad is part of the Unit uh, 42 uh, threat research team at Palo Alto. Palo Alto that makes, you know, they're pretty well known uh, security vendor. Brad does this though on the side just because he's a crazy nice guy. Uh, so uh, if you run into him at a conference or whatever, buy him a beer or something because uh, he puts a ridiculous amount of work into this and maintains it for no uh, cost and effort. And uh, as 
you'll see here momentarily, it's just incredibly, incredibly useful. So, uh, let me go to the right website here. All right, malwaretrafficanalysis.net. So when you come out here, what he's done, um, so this is malwaretrafficanalysis.net, and what you're really interested in is all of these technical blog posts, okay? So for instance, I just had a, one up, right? He's got them organized by year. And so, like I said, he does this on his own, just on the side. Notice those are the dates. Um, he posts, uh, in some cases, multiple times a day, uh, et cetera. And why this is incredibly important, uh, you'll see as we dig in here. So let's pick one. Uh, Let's do the, oh, uh, let's do Quasar Rat. No, nope, no, nope, that one doesn't have the particular, not all of them does he go into the full, yeah, there we go. All right, so notice at the top, he's got uh, the email that was used to send the malicious file. Uh, he's got a packet capture of the actual traffic communications from the malware back to uh, command and control, and he's got the actual malware. That's the malware and artifacts.zip. Those are all encrypted with a password, infected, all lowercase, okay? That's, by the way, common. Uh, that's just kind of an industry standard for anything you're dealing with malicious files, just password protect the files with the password infected. And then everybody knows to do it. Because, of course, if you have your antivirus turned on, when you open this, there's a good chance your antivirus is going to eat the files. Uh, another good reason to handle these in a virtual machine on your host. Um, so why is this so critically important? So there's some screen captures here. And basically what Brad's done is he's walking us through exactly how this, this is, in this case, this is WishRat. Uh, RAT stands for Remote Access Trojan, okay? Uh, that's this component here, right? So he's got the initial infection traffic. We'll come back to that in a second. He's got, he shows uh, all these files being unpacked in a local temp folder. Notice the malware is written in Visual Basic script. That is hugely popular from malicious files. Um, then he's got where it sets up the persistence execution in the registry. So notice under run, um, so on uh, Windows, if you're not familiar, one of the key uh, registry keys is H key current user software Microsoft Windows current version run. Anything that's in the run subsection of the registry will run every time the computer boots. So you can see the command line here, right? W script, which is the Windows script run program built into Windows. And of course, uh, Bob is the sample. That's going to vary based upon the actual username, of course, and then the name of the Visual Basic script file. And then you can see here what it looks like, and he's got the config file. So, given this, let's, let's move back, let's start with from the top. Let's decompose this a little bit. So how might we use this for cyber threat hunting? Of the, the packet capture stuff, what might we look for? Presumably there. I'm sorry? The C2 site. The C2 site, right? So, uh, if you're not familiar with, with these, right, notice the names. These are the domain names that they're going to. So there's a get to JSON on IP API. So I've got, now, uh, there's various sources for this. All right, so id-api.com. So I've got a tool up here uh, from a company called Domain Tools, which you won't all have access to, unfortunately. Uh, but there's all sorts of equivalents. So what I did was, so, so as part of this working up to a hypothesis, 
we want to figure out what of this is normal versus not normal. One of the things that you will see commonly, for instance, is something like maybe north of 60% of malware. One of the first things it does is a DNS query to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Does anybody know the significance of that? Google's DNS. Why in the world would malware be reaching out to Google's DNS? Is Google infected? What do you think? It's exactly right. It's a common technique used by the malware. Do I have internet connectivity? Literally, it's an internet connectivity check. Because what's more um, ubiquitous than Google? Not much, right? So if I can reach out to Google, then I must have internet connectivity. And so what will happen in the malware then is it'll do that check. If, the, if it doesn't get a response, it'll typically go into a sleep cycle, wait 15 minutes or an hour, and it'll check again. And until it succeeds in that check, it won't continue to execute because there's no point often doing what it's trying to do if it can't talk to the internet. But why that's important to understand is because if we're learning how to do this and we put, oh, we're going to block on our firewall 8.8.8.8 .8 in our organization because that's malicious. I uh, think there might be some problems at your organization. <laughs> Things might break, maybe. Um, so, so really important. So what I've done here is I've taken uh, the, uh, to the right. So the first URL it's hitting here is id-api. So I put it into domain tools. So domain tools is, uh, is a tool for uh, defenders like us. Uh, there are a bunch of stuff you can do for free. Uh, I do have access to the paid version because of some of the work I do. Um, notice the score up at the top, 100 average risk. So one of the things that Domain Tools does is it correlates, uh, they basically pull in every domain registered on the internet every day, and they look at all the activity to and from those domains, including malicious, or what is believed to be malicious. And they compute a risk score. Um, and notice there's all sorts of things, phishing, malware, spam, Proximity. Proximity is that it's hosted on a server that has a bunch of other sites. So a domain, right, is just a uh, record that points that when I do, you know, go to id-api.com, uh, I get an IP address, right, of an actual server somewhere on the internet. A proximity means, yep, there. That's a bad neighborhood, so to speak. Uh, in real-world equivalency. The score is 0 to 100, 100 being, yep, we're sure this is really bad. Uh, we have seen, uh, you only get a score of 100 if only malicious traffic is seen using that domain. Okay? So the reason why this is relevant to us as hunters is, okay, this is something we should probably hunt for, right? host going to id-api.com. And so essentially, the way I go about a process like this, so I'm just going to pull up my notebook here, and so I just start keeping a record. OK, id-api.com, then we look at the next record here. Uh, so it's going to train 0077.warzonedns.com, all right? Let's check out warzonedns.com. And again, we'll query it. Oh, look at that. We have another 100. Now, this isn't necessarily typical, right? Because uh, the other thing that's interesting here is notice the number right behind it. Uh, part of why Domain Tools is so powerful for us as defenders. Look at the average age. 
444 days. That's an indication that this threat actor is doing some advanced planning or has been using this domain maliciously for a long time. Okay? Because in our environments, again, we have uh, typically proxy servers. And one of the things those proxy servers will do is categorize sites. No, we shouldn't go to that site because it's categorized as malicious, for instance. And one of the techniques that a lot of the vendors who uh, provide that software use is they look at how long a domain has been registered. Right? So if a domain has only been registered for 30 days or less, and you've got 200 people in your company going to it, either they had a really great ad campaign that just hit, or more likely it's malicious and you've just got uh, uh, fished and a whole bunch of people going out because of that. More likely the latter than the former. But the threat actors, again, see my earlier comments, they're people, they understand that we use those sorts of techniques. So the better actors register domains months and months ahead of when they actually plan to use them and just let them sit so they're accumulating age so when they actually trigger them, they don't set off a bunch of these flags. Okay. So war zone DNS is malicious, uh, very likely. Then we've got, uh, let's see, donut-snack.live. That's an interesting sounding domain. Donut-snack.live. Ah, look at that. Boy, we're batting a thousand. This. Uh, uh, and for what it's worth, Brad does a lot of work to filter out a lot of the background noise uh, when he does these analysis. But I can tell you it's actually quite unusual to get uh, all malicious in those links, which is why you want to be really careful with this. Okay? I just picked this one at random because uh, I'm doing this for real because why not? Um, so now let's look at the URLs they're using. The, literally every single piece of this data is potentially useful for us in a hunt. Okay? So look at the URLs that are being used here. So they're going to a slash JSON. Who thinks that's probably something we should hunt for and, and unusual in our environment? To go to a, a slash JSON link. Come on, be bold. Somebody answer. I think they're trying to receive the command. Uh, well, it's going, yes, but, but do you, uh, my question is, I probably didn't ask it very well, do you think that's unusual or not unusual? Not unusual. Anybody think differently? Everybody know what JSON is, right? Okay, encoding format uh, for mostly computer to computer, you know, program to program communications. Slash JSON is a pretty common URL. So we probably don't necessarily want to hunt for URLs slash JSON. Okay? How about the slash is ready? Maybe? All right, let's put that one on our list then. Okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm just accumulating a list of things to look for. So is ready URL. Uh, and then notice it's so that's a post, and then we're doing a post to update status. Uh, and notice it's cut off in the screenshot, but remember the PCAPs are up above. We can pull the PCAP down and look at it. We'll do that in just a second. Okay? Uh, so we can get that full command light. Then it does a get slash WSH SDK dot zip. What do you think? Malicious, not malicious. Hard to say. Pretty generic, right? This is a, we've seen already, this is a Visual Basic script file. Visual Basic script is run by a command line tool called WScript in Windows. What's an SDK? Software Development Kit. 
you'll find this a lot. The threat actors will very, very intentionally use very generic sounding names by design. Because you could take a look at this and go, oh, yep, that sounds, that sounds normal, legit. Well, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> uh, so WSH. And this is where, uh, again, I was saying earlier, your experience really plays off over time. You get a much better sense for, is that malicious, not malicious? Uh, I skipped over accidentally MOZ-SDK. Uh, that might be interesting. Slash IE, probably pretty common, right? Internet Explorer or Explorer. Yes, that was intentional. I was poking fun at good old Microsoft. They're good people. They're doing some really good stuff on the security front nowadays. but everybody likes to poke fun at Microsoft, right? Uh, and, and so see the process that I'm following here? I'm literally just walking through and just collecting this. This is the data that I'm then going to turn around and search for. So I mentioned earlier uh, we might want to look at those PCAPs. So the easiest way to do that, so I'm just going to download this PCAP, by the way, I have on this hard drive, which we can pass around at some point, the entire malware-traffic-analysis.net. Malware -analysis Brad happens to be a friend of mine, um, super good guy. Uh, if you're thinking about a security conference, I highly recommend uh, Security Onion Con and Besides Augusta, uh, early October. Uh, it's free. Well. Security Onion Con's a hundred bucks, uh, and besides Augusta is free. Um, but for a conference that has the highest density of crazy talented people, Brad being one of them that sh tends to show up there, uh, I, I don't remember him not being there. Because uh, here's the thing, Brad is just like all of us, and. Uh, most of the people who are really, really good at, at this field are super friendly, and you can just walk up to them and strike up a conversation. They would love to chat with you uh, about what they do. Because uh, a lot of us that you know, do this for a living get, I don't know, maybe a little passionate about it. All right, so I downloaded that zip file. So let's open up downloads here. There's our PCAP file. Notice it pops up for a password, which is infected. So we've unzipped it. So now we've got a PCAP file. All right, so let's get over here to a command prompt. And there's our WSH. Let's make a working directory here. We'll just call it hunting. Well, I can't type today, apparently. Wow, I really can't type today. There we go. All right, so let's move. What was that called? There we go. Move that into our hunting directory. All right, so there's our PCAP. Now, of course, we can open this with Wireshark or a number of other tools, but for hunting purposes, I prefer a tool called Zeek. Okay? And what Zeek is, used to be called Bro. They, they got renamed because they got some flack over the name. It did, did have some connotations that weren't the best. That wasn't what they intended, but uh, they recognized it and changed it. So I'm running Zeek-R, and that just says read in from a local uh, from a, uh, a local file, and then I'm giving it a config file called local, which is my local's uh, config. And now when I do an ls, look, I've got a whole bunch of new files. Okay, so what Zeek does is takes the packet data and extracts it all as metadata. 
So each one of these files, so con.log here is the connections. So that's basically the, the equivalent of uh, NetFlow data, if you're familiar with NetFlow data. So source and destination IP, what kind of protocol, was it TCP or UDP, DNS, so on and so forth, right? Um, how many bytes were transferred? Nothing about the actual content. And then um, uh, PE.log is any, so these are created dynamically based upon the content of the packet capture. So the fact that PE.log exists means there were some Windows PE headers in the file spotted. Now, I've got an optional setting turned on. That's why I use the slash local. Notice I've got a folder here called extract files. One of the options with Zeek uh, is to extract any files that pass uh, in it on protocols that it recognizes. And so if I go into CD extract files here, notice I've got a bunch of files these were all, you can tell, these were extracted from HTTP. Those were all extracted from HTTP. So these were all files that were transferred over HTTP, okay? That weird number at the end is what's called uh, Zeke's connection ID. And what's interesting is every single session has a connection ID assigned to it. Why that's useful for us in hunting is let's say one of these files turns out to be interesting, we can search for that connection ID across all of those other files and we'll find all of the other instances. So if there's DNS done on that connection, if there's HTTP, so on and so forth. And of course, since I'm, I'm driving essentially a Linux, uh, type it without the S, file, and notice we can see what we've got here. So we've got a bunch of files that are ASCII text. Those are probably just part of the post and get stuff being transferred. Notice there's a zip file in there. There's two Python scripts. There's some JSON. And there's ASCII text with very long lines. What, what do you think ASCII text with very long lines might be? Any guesses? You, a lot of you've done development work. Okay. What's one of the most common forms of encoding to transfer binary files over the internet? Base64. If you convert something binary into Base64, do you end up with a really long line, long string, essentially? Odds are that's some base64 encoded data in that ASCII text with a long line. And of course we can check that directly. So take file. Yep, that sure enough looks like uh, looks like base64 encoded data, doesn't it? Or at least it does to me. <coughs> I may have spent a little bit too long looking at base64 data. I'm not quite as good as a coworker of mine, a uh, uh, friend of mine, Paul Melson. Uh, you should look up his talks uh, from Besides Augusta. They're up on YouTube. I highly, highly recommend. He does a lot of work with threat actor tracking. Uh, he's got a scraper, an open source scraper he's written to scrape off of Pastebin. Uh, believe it or not, Pastebin is used to exchange malicious data all the time, pretty much constantly. Uh, and so he's written a scraper to scrape it all and identify. He's looked at so much Base64, he can read it by just looking at it, which is just kind of scary. Uh, but that's, that's the depths that, that uh, you can end up with. So, so were we reverse engineering this, all right, and I'm not going to go any further down this particular, but I wanted to introduce you to some of these concepts because some of these concepts are incredibly important for you developing your hunting skills, right? And by the way, I, I completely forgot to use at the beginning why I like the term hunting for this, okay? Because uh, I think it's a really good analogy. Um, 
I, I mentioned in my intro, right, I'm uh, ex-law enforcement. Uh, so I am, it's safe to say, very proficient with firearms. Uh, necessary for that profession, uh, but I quite enjoy it. I actually uh, go to the uh, range three to five times a week um, to maintain those skills. But I am not a hunter. Uh, I've got a uh, Brother-in-law, my, my wife's brother, Dean, is an avid deer hunter. So on one hand, arguably, I am more skilled with a firearm than my brother-in-law is. No question, however, Dean is a better deer hunter than I am. And the difference, of course, is that Dean has a level of understanding of the habits of the deers that I do not. I know what a deer looks like. Right? I know what a deer is, but that's not the same as having a really deep understanding of their habits and their patterns. And that's what a successful hunter has to master in order to be good at hunting. The same thing applies and why I think the term is a really good analogy. That's why we're spending so much time on understanding the adversarial tools because this is the heart of being a successful cyber threat hunter. This depth of understanding of the tools, their techniques, that's how you become a successful cyber threat hunter. Right? All right, so back to our file. Uh, so notice here, uh, we've got connection log, files log, um, DNS log, right, we've got, oh, and there's HTTP log. So let's, I was going, wait a minute, there should be some HTTP in here. So the reason why I've been making all of these things and why Zeek is so powerful for us is because here's the text file of all of the HTTP sessions. So all those URIs, et cetera, that we were looking at here, all of this has been extracted into this text file. So now we can take these things that we're looking for, right, moz-sdk, and we can use simple grep to look for them in the files. Now, of course, because we're looking at the PCAP of the extracted file, that we'll, we'll find it, right? We know it's in there because it's a PCAP of the screenshot. But this same technique that I just applied, what I'm going to have you do in a little bit is this is the URL. I've got a bunch of these files on the hard drive. In particular, uh, let me scroll down slightly, sorry. There's a whole bunch of, where are they hiding on here for me? Oh, right here at the top, sorry. So this WRCC, by the way, there's a ton of great resources on here uh, for practicing for hunting, but in particular, this particular archive this is from a capture the flag event held every year uh, for doing this kind of activity. And these are a bunch of packet captures. So for instance, if we go to the 2018, notice terabytes of network packet captures. So what we do is we take Zeek, we run Zeek-R on each of those packet captures and consolidate them. Okay, now to do that, you're going to want to use something like, uh, where did my, there it goes. Uh, so uh, on my GitHub, which you'll see a uh, uh, link to this later, I've got an example of a shell script that I use to do this. Uh, you don't have to use the shell script, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but what I'm essentially doing here is I'm in a subdirectory, copy a PCAC down, run, in this case, bro, I haven't updated it to Zeek. They just name changed about nine months ago. Uh, so run Zeek over the packet capture, 
take that HTTP file, move it, and then consolidate all of those. Because in your environment, when you go to hunt for real, you're going to want to partner with whoever, maybe your network team, has the ability to capture traffic in your environment. Probably capture it right at the internet gateway is usually the best spot to, to hunt for malicious activity since it's going to be one of talking to the internet. Okay? And then convert it, and then we can go grepping on all of these things for it. Make sense? Okay. All right. So it's uh, five after two. Why don't we take a break? Because uh, I have been blathering on at you for quite a bit. 15-minute uh, break till 20 after. <laughs>